This works. Uh, I'll give a talk on some basic, uh, very basic aspects of functional function, and then uh, Stan, David, and uh, Bill will follow with uh, their presentations. They'll have question and answer period, and then uh, break for whatever you want to break for. <laughs> All right, so the first thing, uh, what I'd really like to do in this presentation is talk about some very basic aspects of phonation, basically those aspects that are the controlling variables that we have to deal with in the clinic, in the studio, in training of all sorts. The vocal folds are made up of a range of tissue, and I'm going to go backwards now. This is actually the vocalis muscle location. Lateral to that is the lateral thyroid muscle. And the tension of this muscle depends upon its contraction level. As you go more medial, you have the deep layer, the superficial layer, and the, the, the deep layer, intermediate, intermediate layer, and the superficial layer. And as you go that direction, the vocal fold material becomes more pliable. And this pliability is an extremely important function of normal uh, phonation. So you see up here, this is a rendering of this uh, very often seen uh, schematic. Then we have also, of course, the epithelium on top of that. Under normal light, because the vocal folds are vibrating, the edges appear blurred. Under a stroboscopic light, the vibrations can be seen in slow motion. And that motion that you just saw, this is at a large mucosa wave that this uh, person, a uh, lot of Japanese uh, woman, um, was showing. And the schematic here shows this muscle, uh, the vocal fold here, the vocalis is the more medial portion, and then this mucosa that the important aspect that I want to bring home is that it's very pliable, it's going to be deformed. There's a large deformation to that tissue as the uh, cycle goes through its various positions. And so here you can see the stretching and release of the mucosa, and also you can see uh, a convergent glottis here when the folds are separating, as well as a divergent glottis when the vocal folds are coming back. So the makeup of the tissue here is really important. If you have a lesion, if you have um, scar tissue, if you have extra mass, that changes the morphology of the vocal fold, and thus it's going to move in a different manner, giving rise quite often to a rough sounding voice. So one of the questions we have is just what is a fundamental frequency? How do you measure that? When there is a cycle of phonation like you see here, this is, uh, these are 10 steps, so to speak, in the schematic. The vocal folds are together here, and then they separate, and as they are separating, we call that the glottal opening phase. And then when the vocal folds come back toward each other, we call that the glottal closing, closing phase. Notice that we say the vocal folds separate and move back toward each other, but the glottis opens and closes. It's kind of a jargonal, jargon kind of distinction. And then when the vocal folds are together, they will come together at the bottom and roll together and then start all over again. Now, the time it takes for one cycle is called the period. The period is designated in seconds. So if you have 0 0.01 second, if you invert that, you get the value of 100. And that's how many hertz, that's the fundamental frequency, a period of 0 0.01 second is. By the way, you also will know that 0.01 is also 10 milliseconds, so many of you know milliseconds. So the relationship of a period and fundamental is that, they're just the inverse of each other. 
And so that would be for one cycle of phonation, which uh, we get to that story. Understood. The viscopic kind. That's one cycle. So when that one cycle was, say, this uh, 10 milliseconds or 100 hertz. If I say, uh, uh, something like that, that's about 100 hertz. Another basic aspect of control is fundamental uh, is a vocal fold and length, and the, the consequent contour of the vocal fold. So the vocal fold length, relative to fundamental frequency, is is controlled by two muscles actually. There has been mention of the cricothyroid muscle, which is the muscle between the cricoid here and the thyroid here, and when that muscle contracts it actually elongates the vocal folds. Well, how does it do that? The cricoid cartilage is down here, and when the vocal folds are short, we'll notice that the vocal folds are connected to the arytenoid cartilage at the vocal process region, and then come over and attach to the thyroid cartilage. Well, when the cricothyroid muscle is relaxed, the distance between this front part of the Cricoid and the thyroid is greatest, meaning that the vocal folds are shortest. But now when the cricothyroid contracts, it pulls the front here of the cricoid up toward the thyroid cartilage, rotating the cricoid on the cricothyroid joint here. And because the arytenoid cartilages are attached to the top, the arytenoid cartilages move back. Well, the vocal folds then move back as well, elongating them. So the vocal folds now are elongated by the action of this cricothyroid muscle contraction here. I can get that back in there. See that? So that's kind of cool. Notice that typically the thyroid cartilage does not dip down, although in many of the chapters, the books that you see, you'll see this thyroid cartilage moving down. It's the relative relationship between the cricoid and the thyroid. Another way you can actually see this is when you're looking at scoping and you have a person go, uh, you'll see the vocal folds elongate, but you'll see that the, the vocal fold near the vocal process will go back in the, in the picture rather than the front coming forward. This means that the cricoid is tilting, tilting the arytenoid back. So whenever you look at, so this week when you're looking at pitch change, if you get to see that, uh, notice that. And you'll see that the cricoid actually uh, tilts rather than, tilts up rather than the thyroid cartilage going down. And then also, uh, let me do this first. The cricothyroid muscle has an antagonistic muscle relative to the length of the vocal pole, and that's the vocalis muscle. <coughs> When the vocalis muscle itself contracts, because it is part of the vocal fold here, when it contracts, it's going to reduce the length of itself, meaning that it's going to reduce the length of the entire fold, including this mucosa. So notice that when the vocalis contracts and shortens the mucosa here, the mucosa tension is actually going to reduce. So the CT and the vocalis are antagonistic relative to the length of the vocal fold, and therefore the tension, especially when you close it. Also, when you have a very low pitch, you have this depth to the vocal fold here, which creates a depth, a vertical depth, for the glottis itself, which is this airspace between the vocal folds. And you also get a little bit more depth if you contract the vocalis so that it bulges a little bit medially. As you raise the pitch, the vocal folds are going to elongate. Well, the volume of the vocal fold doesn't change, so it's got to give some place, and that would be the cross-sectional area, right? Like a rubber band. It's thinner as you stretch it out. And so this lower portion, which is the, uh, the inferior surface of the vocal fold, it moves up a little bit so that there is now a little less distance, vertical distance here of the vocal fold and the glottal region. And then for falsetto, high pitches, you'll get a much thinner vocal fold yet. And this might just be like one millimeter thickness here. 
So that's a vocal cord length relative to this important aspect of fundamental frequency. This is the what's called the string equation, and I tell you it um, it is a very important equation. You want to be you want to be friends with equations that have variables in them that tell you about how things are controlled. So my students have to learn this all the time. So why not share it with you? <laughs> that is, if you look at this expression here, the fundamental frequency or the, the vibratory rate and the, the frequency of a, a string, vibration, wire, it depends on a number of things. This L here is in fact the length of the tissue, in this case, in motion. And here we have the square root of T. Well, T is the tension, the good tension, the physical tension. There's good tension, by the way. This is natural physical tension. Uh, of the tissue that is in motion. And so, as the vocal folds elongate, they become a little stiffer. That is, the tension inside that material increases. And the pitch actually goes up. The fundamental frequency goes up. But why does that happen? Even the square root of that tension increase increases faster than the length increases as you stretch the vocal folds. This row here is the density of the tissue, and that stays about the same no matter what the, the length is actually. So this example here, this expression here, is really good relative to explain why the fundamental frequency, why the pitch of the voice tends to rise as you stretch the vocal folds. But there's another expression. If you use these terms down at the bottom left here, which we're not going to go through, but if you use them, you can transfer this expression into this other expression here, where we now have F, which is a force. And you can think of this force as the contraction force of the cricothyroid trying to stretch that vocal fold. So it's like the cricothyroid resulting force. L is still the length, but now we have the actual mass of the tissue in motion. Now, what this expression is really good for is to try to explain why the fundamental frequency decreases when you have edema. If you get laryngitis, if you have edema, if you actually were too excited about your team last night, <laughs> You may use the same amount of cricothyroid force, you may have the same length, but you have edema, you have engorged vocal folds, the mass is greater, and because that mass is down here, it makes this whole value here lower, right? Larger mass, this whole expression here is lower. And this means that the fundamental frequency is going to actually decrease. If you're clever, you can actually figure out how much more mass there was in the sick larynx by knowing what the fundamental frequency was before and after, or after and next, relative to normal and pathological. Um, right, so this is, I actually really want you to consider any equation that you see in front of you to figure out how those variables interact and how, to, how does that control what we do in voice, speech, and anything else in life. Fundamental frequency is also a very basic aspect of vocal registers. We have the very basic registers for speech, vocal fry, chest or modal, and falsetto. And everybody in this room is also familiar with head registers, mixed registers, and more subtle aspects of registration. But let's take a look at um, fry and chest and falsetto so we have a pretty good idea of what's going on there. <clears throat> The vocal folds are quite short, so the CT muscle is not contracting much at all in vocal fry. In fact, a person who fries all day, their CT muscle is not being exercised too much. And so in the clinic, we just have them do some falsetto. We, we have to exercise that CT and get them out of the familiar location of vocal fry. Also, you'll notice here that 
Uh, the false vocal folds are more medialized, position more medialized. There's a fair amount of adduction going on here. The vocal folds are very short and they're very pliable, so they have a very long close time for the glottis. But it's a very constricted situation here. In fact, some people use vocal fry to train the adductor muscles, to strengthen the adductor muscles. There are uh, closet fibers. That. And here's the attempt to strobe fry. Good luck with that. That's working pretty good. Now the chest register, the vocal folds here are considerably longer. Uh, here you see a beautiful mucosa wave that won the award. I don't know, sure. sure. <laughs> uh, should be a national competition for mucosa wave. <laughs> In falsetto, the vocal folds are shorter and longer yet, but notice that just the upper edges are vibrating. So that upper one millimeter or so, it's the same motion, but less, right? So uh, those are up now.